like don't be afraid to stand up for yourself and your boundaries right because especially in the world of small businesses and freelancing if you don't know your boundaries or if you don't know like even your self-esteem or self-worth like you're just going to try to copy what everybody else is doing right whether it's trying to do paid ads right off the bat whether it's um you know email marketing when you don't even have an email list right I think the most important thing is you know standing up for yourself and your belief and also it's almost like having tunnel vision I'll say right like kind of blocking out mm -hmm. the noise of what other people are doing I would say it's really important when you're first starting out because um, I think the best returns I've seen in my business have come from just you know that laser focus not really caring or paying too much attention to what competitors are doing like of course you want to you know make sure your um, products or knowledge is up to industry part right but you don't want to keep comparing yourself in the beginning Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as uh, um, <clears throat> the founder and, and CEO of uh, Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. You ever need help with yours? Just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great uh, guest on the podcast, Michelle Guo. And uh, Michelle is uh, or started out her journey uh, going through a, a few different phases of the journey. Started out in high school, never really saw herself as a business owner, but uh, uh, or nonetheless uh, continued on her journey. Uh, parents uh, had some uh, medical issues, went uh, to high school in uh, NYC, uh, and then went off to Syracuse University, studied some uh, or studied architecture, wanted something more fast paced connected to the community and tied to technology. So switched over and interned to do some editorial or with an editorial company, writing articles, got interested in the legal side um, and graduated with, I think, a degree in econ, studied for the LSAT, thought about going to law school, uh, worked for a law firm for a paralegal as a, as a paralegal for a period of time, wanted more flexibility with their, their career. Um, so uh, ended up uh, go, or switching from the law side of things to go to computer science and then started the, the current business and uh, doing what she's doing now. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Michelle. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. And yes, I've done a lot of different things, um, but I'm very happy with where I am right now as a copywriter and founder of Magic Cave Media, my own small business. So I'm really excited to dive in with you. Um, how the journey's been so far and share our story with, you know, ever small business owners or people aspiring to that path. Awesome. Well, excited for a, a great, uh, great uh, interview and a great uh, podcast. So, so I just took uh, the much longer uh, journey and condensed in the, the 30 second version of it. Um, so why don't we uh, rewind and unpack that a bit? So tell us a little bit about uh, how your journey got uh, started in high school, never really seeing yourself as a, as a business owner. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, as a kid, I always had a creative side. I was always um, doing artwork and DIY arts and crafts. But at that time, um, you know, as a kid, you think, oh, like, you know, I want to be a doctor, lawyer. It's very up in the air. Um, so I was still unsure, but I saw architecture as a way to uh, like kind of marry my interest in artistry and expression and also my love for data and numbers. I mean, that's why I got my degree in computer science, right? Because I do mm. like working with that analytical side, but too much of it and I get too bored, right? So I feel like that's been a huge theme of my personal career journey in terms of trying to find something that has a great balance between those two, right? So going from architecture to international relations and economics, um, I chose those majors because I really wanted to study abroad at Syracuse University. That was a huge reason, um, but it was definitely worth it because that's where um, I studied abroad in London and Washington, D.C., got some editorial experience, um, as you mentioned previously. And yeah, then after that, you know, I worked for the Onondaga District, Att um, District Attorney's office as um, an intern doing legal stuff, I thought, okay, like, you know, I can live with this, right? So um, then I went out, um, studied for the ELSA, and, you know, as you mentioned, became a paralegal, right? I mean, you know much more about IP than I do, right? Um, sure. For sure. But um, 
from my you know brief experience doing trademarks and um, design patents, I know that it's it can be grueling sometimes. There are a lot of small details, right? You have to look at the MPEP. There are a lot of small things and deadlines are a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I'm glad to um, you know share the experience of like having that hard foundation of you know being really organized and diligent, right? When it comes to not being afraid to work with the law. Um, but ultimately, it did feel a little bit dry to me. Like I've known people who um, have had successful work-life balances in IP law for sure. Um, I just know for me, you know, the billable hour was something that I kind of struggled with at times because um, I would often not like zone out, but I often found that I would get distracted. I think my creative mind was always going on in the background, right, mm. which made it hard for me to focus now that could be you know other things whether it's um potential I, I don't know like ADHD or just like you know being bored with it it could be a lot of different things right but um whatever it was I just knew that you know it wasn't the path for me but you know I still respect everything IP right because I filed for copyrights in my own small business um I'm glad I you know got to file design patents for um you know, really big companies. I'm glad I know about trademarks, right? Especially if I ever go into it for my own business. And I think um, it did set me up for a good foundation in terms of the legal setup in my business, you know, not being afraid to file an LLC, putting a privacy policy on my website, um, something that I noticed, you know, a lot of people skip over, but I do think it's important, especially if you're going out and selling digital products, which um, I am doing for the first time. So fingers crossed that goes well. We'll see how well, it goes. Yeah, and let me sort of dive into that a bit. So you started out, I think, is thought about it, your architecture, graduated with econ, paralegal as a law firm. So how did you kind of progress to or, or make that, you know, figure out what path you were? Because I think it eventually got into uh, more computer science or computer engineering and doing software side as well. So walk us through a little bit as to... You know, it seems like there was a bit of an iteration and evolution as you're figuring out what you enjoyed, what you wanted to do, and, and kind of what that path was for. So how did you kind of figure out what you are finally wanted to, to settle in on or, or land on? Yeah, that's a great question, because I know it's something that, um, I mean, finding fulfillment in career is something that people sometimes go through their whole lives and still don't figure out, right? But for me, I think it came down to becoming more self-aware along my career journey. By that, I mean, finding a balance between the lifestyle that I wanted, right? Because lifestyle, I, I'm very sure that it's an important part of, you know, whatever career you want to go into, right? Like, do you want to live the lifestyle of an attorney um, working in big law, right? Like that looks really different than somebody in a private practice for themselves, um, you know, in a small or like a rural area, right? So- mm. Um, for me, you know, I really had to do some reflection in the lifestyle that I wanted, right? Am I willing to, um, you know, sacrifice a steady paycheck for more flexibility in my schedule, right? And I think it also depends on the phase of life you're in as well. Um, you know, being in my 20s, I, I feel like I'm able to explore more, um, especially, you know, now before um, if I ever have kids in the future, right? I feel like now is the time to do it. Um, not saying that, you know, people with kids can't do it. I mean, of course, there are so many successful people in that avenue, right? Um, but I know for me, like, I feel like for me, I would just get very overwhelmed um, if that were the case. But anyway, going back to um, your question, I think the computer science thing came about because as I was um, going into intellectual property law journey, I realized that I would need um, like a STEM background or degree in order to advance and take the patent bar, right? If I ever wanted, um, for example, a law firm to take me seriously or cover uh, my patent bar expenses or law school as a associate, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that is something I thought about and I did always have an interest in technology. Um, so that's why I went into mobile app development a little bit in addition to um, research during my degree because, um, you know, I still have this interest in creativity, as I mentioned, as a kid, right? And I thought mobile app development and design was a great avenue to get started in that. Um, and the research part came about more so as um, like a personal endeavor, right? Like I always wanted to be a published author and I'm, you know, very grateful that I won 
awards while I was at um, at my master's degree. It's not something that I expected for sure. Um, but, you know, it's very, um, I guess, validating in a way that I have that strong technical foundation, which does give me confidence um, in, you know, whatever I do next in my career. No, makes perfect sense. So now, so or kind of unpacking that a bit. So, you know, you kind of started down the path of doing maybe a little bit more of the computer science and programming and app development with the idea of, hey, if I want to be, you know, or qualified or, or have the career path to, to go down on the, the intellectual property front, um, then, you know, or have that technical background and be able to sit for the patent bar and that uh, all makes sense now. Walk us through. So you, you start down that path and I believe you got a degree in computer science. Is that right? Yeah, master's so now, of science. So now you got the the bachelor's of science degree. Now you didn't end up going the or the legal route or the intellectual property or going to law school and doing some of that. So walk us through kind of as you're going through that, where did things shift and change and kind of or walk us through the, the journey of how you, you ended up uh, where you're at today. Okay, so in January 2021, so a little over two years ago, that's when I quit the law firm job. I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. Um, I actually quit my job the same day as my partner, you know, because we were just um, kind of burnt out from the nine to five grind, to be honest, um, working for these big companies. And we just wanted to reevaluate our careers. At that time, I was um, still working on my master's of computer science degree. Uh, I was doing it part time while I was working at the law firm. Uh, So here, because I graduated uh, with my degree in May 2021. Um, you know, during that time, I really worked on my thesis to graduate. That's when I got my published research. That's when I um, got more serious about mobile app development and my portfolio there on GitHub. Um, so, you know, that's what I did during that span of time. But right after May 2021, um, that's when my parents had health emergencies, right? So um, I was thinking about working for different startups. I did have some offers from, uh, you know, colleagues to work on some really cool things like, you know, AI, HVAC systems, whatever. But, um, you know, because I was moving to New York during that time, because um, to me, you know, family takes priority and it was a personal decision to move out from living with my partner in DC back to New York City, right? Mm. Um, that's why, you know, I filed my company in New York, right? Because I think it just made more sense at that time, like otherwise I would have probably filed it in you know Washington DC or Virginia. Um, but because I was at New York at that time, that's why I followed, filed it there for my company. Now, because I needed, again, that flexibility to um, care for my disabled dad um, and my mother. Uh, so my mom's recovered by now, but my dad is still, you know, unfortunately disabled. He needs um, assistance 24 um, seven. He's a quadriplegic, meaning, he can't really, you know, move his legs and arms um, to the fullest extent. Um, but, you know, please pray for him. I mean, he's still going strong. He still has a great attitude towards life. Um, so, you know, I still look to him for inspiration. But yes, going back to my career journey. So, you know, given those things, I was like, well, like working for a software startup might be kind of stressful, right? Because I think in startups, that's the kind of environment where I think a lot of serious companies, especially if they have funding, they really value a lot of growth and hard work in the beginning, right? Like, I don't think Mm. a lot of them appreciate, um, you know, people who need a lot of time off or vacation or unsure about, um, you know, their family situation joining startups in the the beginning, right? Like, they want, like, um, usually people who can commit, like, you know, an insane amount of hours per week, right? Like, 40, 60, 80, whatever hours so that their product can launch. Cause I do think speed is really important um, to, you know, a lot of software startups, which I understand, right? So for me, that kind of ruled out that option. Um, also corporate burnout still at that point um, was one reason, you know, I didn't um, pursue again, the legal or the IP route. Um, so, you know, I was trying to figure out, you know, what am I doing with my life at this time, right? And for me, um, that's when I dived into, more of the coaching space because um so to add another thing to my career journey so I always you know had an interest in psychology um Mm -hmm. I thought about becoming a therapist in my life but I was like well I already have like you know my bachelor's and master's degree it's kind of too late for that that's why I thought in my head I mean I don't think it's too late for anything but 
you know, logistically and practically, it was like, okay, what's the, you know, closest thing I can get to that, right? And for me, that was coaching. Um, so that's why I earned my coaching certification, um, you know, a few months ago. And that's where, you know, I was like, oh, maybe I could make coaching into a business. Now, I'm not going to lie, I had no idea in the beginning what I was doing at the time. I think it was kind of too vague to be an actual viable business idea. But as I started talking to more people, cold outreaching to people on LinkedIn, you know, started um, becoming more serious about how to conduct sales calls and, you know, how to do actual business with people. That's where, you know, I got more of the hang of it and realized that the things that people were willing to pay for, right? I think life coaching in general is a hard sell. Um, I do know some people who are successful in it, but it's pretty tough. I do think there's an amount of luck involved. Um, and I think it comes down to personal preference as well. But for me, I know that I prefer, you know, working more in the back end. I like to do the copywriting. I like to have one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, I'm not, you know, the type who's um, extremely extroverted, right? Like I like to have privacy and be in my own creative flow. Um, so, you know, hopefully that gives an idea of uh, where I got to today. Um, I'm happy to go more into detail about specific parts of the journey. Yeah, no, I think that that was a great walkthrough and a good overview. So that you kind of to your point now, if you're to walk through kind of uh, clue us in. So, you know, you, you mentioned it uh, briefly, but what is the business today? What did you land on? And kind of uh, where do you see things uh, headed and uh, continuing to grow or, or and grow in what direction? Yeah, absolutely. So my small business is called Magic Ace Media. Now it's a copywriting and creative agency. So it wasn't always like that. In the beginning, it was more focused on, you know, just life coaching, that general stuff, um, kind of, you know, doing a lot of different things from helping people with sales funnels to helping people with packaging their offer, which I still do, right? But we've recently expanded our services to look more like a um, like a full scale creative agency in terms of, you know, offering also web design or um, copywriting for advertisements and helping small businesses manage those things, right? So that's, you know, more of the next move for Magic Cave Media. Now it's kind of in that transition phase right now, um, you know, as we're working out different business strategies and launching our first digital product, all very exciting stuff. Um, I personally, in my personal career, I would love to, for Magic Cave Media to, you know, get more big clients when it comes to um, like advertising, that this would be something new for sure. Um, but I do think advertising is so fun to get into. Again, it um, similar to my reasoning for going into architecture, you know, marrying that analytical data side with the creativity side. I think advertising is really similar in that you're working with a lot of data metrics and numbers and definitely, you know, a budget, right? Um, but you're also, you know, always coming up with new ad creatives, ways to get customers and connect. Um, so, you know, I think it's very much a, an avenue that combines those things and psychology, right? Uh, which is why I think it's really an exciting avenue, especially as the world becomes more digital in its presence. Um, so, you know, that's the future vision for Magic Cave, right? Mm. Um, but yes, I think, Magic Cave has definitely gone through a lot of evolutions. Again, as we've um, done a lot of, you know, outreaching to people, we started on LinkedIn, right? Um, and connecting with people over coffee chats to get to know their needs. Um, so we figured out, you know, what worked, what didn't. I hired um, two of my friends at the time um, to help me, you know, get started with the website and social media. It was super fun and super challenging as well. Um, but I, you know, I don't regret anything. Um, even though the whole endeavor was, you know, quite expensive, I'm not gonna lie, but I do think ultimately, you know, the returns are worth it. No, it sounds like awesome. Sounds like it was a a good journey. Figure or took a a period of time to evolve and uh, figure out uh, what you know what uh, lined up with your interests and uh, what made sense and uh, what uh, fit the fit the career path for you. But uh, in the end, uh, figured it out and now on a, a good path to continue to expand and to grow and uh, definitely a, a fun place to be. So well, with that, now as, as we kind of reach the uh, present day of the journey and even looking a bit into the future, always a great time to uh, transition to the two questions I always asked at the end of each episode. Um, so we'll jump to those now. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? What'd you learn from it? Okay, so the worst decision I made was 
hiring the wrong business coach right when I was starting my business. Now, I won't get too much into detail um, as, you know, there may be some legal things that are currently being worked through uh, because the person I was working with didn't deliver the services, right? So it, it's a very messy story. But anyway, um, all that to say, I think this person was trying to push for paid advertising too soon in the business, right? And I think for any business coach, um, working with somebody in the beginning, they should really, you know, do, have integrity and say like, hey, like, you know, I don't think you're ready for paid ads or like, um, you know, at least deliver what they're promising, mm -hmm. right? And I do think maybe on my end, I could have done more due diligence on the person, like, you know, on their profile. They seem, you know, pretty legit, right? They work for pretty big prestigious companies. Um, I didn't find, you know, anything exactly wrong with their approach. But now that I look back in hindsight, I'm like, okay, maybe, I, you know, I could have taken some time not to rush into a decision um, to work with this specific person, right? Um, this mm -hmm. person was not very communicative and responsive, which is, you know, pretty unfortunate because they did seem like a pretty intelligent person. Um, but it's really the dishonesty of, you know, they're promising a program that doesn't exist and they never delivered the program at the end of the day, right? So um, as somebody who comes from a legal background, you know, I was, of course, looking for ways to uh, protect myself legally after that, right? And also share the word with other people how they can protect themselves, um, legally right when it comes to this stuff and I, one thing i i do think i could have done is i could have looked at the contract more carefully right in terms of the deliverables that were promised um even the refund clauses you know all these little things that i think a lot of business owners don't uh, think about until it becomes a problem right mm -hmm. but i do think being proactive on the legal side um and moreover just protecting yourself in general right like having those strong boundaries um and good judgment will definitely save you and protect you in the long run. No, definitely makes sense. And uh, there sounds like, a, a, you know, an easy <laughs> mistake to make. And, you know, one where you, you're looking to expand, grow and get uh, advice and people on your side and mentors and all of those things in place. And sometimes you, you know, you rush in too quick or you don't uh, pay attention to it as much as you can and, and whatnot. And so definitely an easy mistake to make, but a great one to learn from. Yeah. Second question now that I like to ask is now if you're talking to somebody that's just getting into a startup or a small business, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give them? I would say the number one piece of advice. Ooh, okay. Such a challenging question, but I love this. Um, I would say it goes back to, you know, the first lesson, um, like, don't be afraid to stand up for yourself and your boundaries, right? Because especially in the world of small businesses and freelancing, if you don't know your boundaries, or if you don't know, like, even your self-esteem or self-worth, like, you're just going to try to copy what everybody else is doing, right? Whether it's trying to do paid ads right off the bat, whether it's, um, you know, email marketing, when you don't even have an email list, right? I think the most important thing is, you know, standing up for yourself and your belief and also it's almost like having tunnel vision, I'll say, right? Like kind of blocking out the noise of what other people are doing. I would say it's really important when you're first starting out because um, I think the best returns I've seen in my business have come from just, you know, that laser focus, not really caring or paying too much attention to what competitors are doing. Like, of course you wanna, you know, make sure your um, products or knowledge is up to industry part, right? But you don't wanna keep comparing yourself in the beginning. So. Um, you know, that's the main tip that I would give to people, you know, stand up for yourself and your beliefs, always make sure to um, protect yourself in business. No, I think that's uh, definitely a, a great piece of advice and, uh, and a great uh, takeaway. So, well, awesome. Well, that was, uh, we wrapped towards the end of the episode. If people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more. Yeah, absolutely. So the best way to reach out to me uh, would be on Instagram, on Facebook. My handle is at Michelle Ann Guo. Um, or you can reach out on LinkedIn to my personal profile or my business profile, Magic Cave Media. So those platforms, um, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook are the best ways to reach out.
Awesome. We'll definitely uh, encourage people to reach out, support a great business, and if nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again, Michelle, for uh, coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you listeners that are out there, if you have your own journey to share and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So just go to inventiveguest.com, apply to be on the show. A couple more things as listeners, make sure to click share, subscribe, leave us a review, helps us to reach even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey to success. And on that note, if you ever need help with your patents, your trademarks, or anything else with your startup or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Well, thank you again, Michelle, for coming on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Awesome. Thank you so much, Devin. It was such a pleasure. My pleasure.